Well, good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. We're live on Facebook and YouTube. Um, my name is Sarah Tabo. I'm going to be your host this evening. And together with a number of guests, we're going to be talking about how we can grow stronger together as a Christian community and as the church. Um, some of you may know me. I'm a UK-based worship leader, singer, and songwriter. And this is the first time I'm doing anything of this nature. So I'm really excited about having all these guests talk with me and also with yourselves if you're watching live on youtube or um facebook can you please share the link to this live stream as well we're really looking forward to having an engaging session with you all so i'm going to very briefly introduce my guest and also if you can comment on facebook or any platform if you're struggling to hear but i suspect the connectivity is excellent this evening so i'm just going to briefly introduce the guests that i have on today we have um, individuals from the UK and equally internationally. We have some American and South African guests this evening. So I'm going to start with Dr. Chooks. He is one of the top um, Christian podcasters in the UK. He has a podcast called The Daily Benefit, which is a really inspirational and uplifting podcast. If you haven't already, go check it out. We also have Les Moore, music a &R and coach, and um, I would call him a legend, um, and I'm sure he's going to tell us a bit more about that himself. From the US, we have Leon Tumbo, who's a singer-songwriter, somebody I actually admire as a worship leader as well. And from South Africa, we have Colin Damans. He's one of a music duo, multi-award winning South African music duo, Bongi and Colin. And that's actually himself and his wife. I find that really admirable. And finally, from the UK, we also have Helen Youssef, a lovely friend of mine, worship leader, preacher and artist. And today and every week for this entire season series, she's going to be painting live professionally which I think is phenomenal. I couldn't have asked for anything more from a session like this, which is really beautiful. So guys, if you can, let's just give her a warm round of applause. Thank you so much, Helen. Okay, so we're going to dive straight into it. Um, I know some of you have been asking or be wondering why um, Stronger Together, why this, why now? Um, as you probably all know, last year we had an eruption of a lot of conversations globally around race matters, racial you know, injustices from the US spiraling through literally the entire continent, the entire globe even. And we had demonstrations and activities, conversations, questions being asked, answers, but probably not as many answers as we'd have wanted. And then the conversation died down. And I'm personally of the opinion that it's great that we keep the conversation going, that we keep ex exploring opportunities for solution and ways that we can grow together and also grow in unity together. And that's why we're doing this today. So um, without further ado, I'm going to start by asking probably the first question to our panelists. Um, a lot of times when I have conversations with people on racism in the church and outside of the church, the answers about what racism really is, is often quite different person to person. And I find that quite interesting. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I was quite particular about getting an international, you know, set of panel panelists so that we could see if the viewpoint is different in different parts of the world. So I'll probably start by asking you, probably just go around the entire table. What do you understand racism to mean? And do you think that your view of racism is at odds or in line with what society thinks racism is? So I'll just start from the top, you know, chooks and work our way down. Uh, th thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, Sarah, firstly, amazing. I think this is a conversation that yes. uh, we need to be definitely having a lot more. You know, I was talking to my friend not too long ago and we we're talking about how topics of racism or race and the church, it's like, it's like a birthday meal, happens once a year and everyone forgets about it in between. Mm. But hopefully this conversation will be a bit more like, like breakfast, you know, something you have every day and it's, you're, you know, you're thinking about it um, a lot more. Racism. Um, I think for me, racism is when there's discrimination against a particular race. I think when it's actually active, a discrimination against, not if you think it, I think that's more prejudice. I think if there's racism, mm. there needs to be something that's proactive. Um, now, there's systemic racism and there's other things which I'm sure we'll get to. But for me personally, I think the term racism, I think, is used a bit too much. Um, and uh, cynically, I actually think it's intentionally banded around too much in order to undermine or trivialise true racism, which we experience on, you know, a day to day. You know, we just talk, everyone throws around the term racism and actually what's happening is 
when racism actually does exist and we're not taking it as seriously as we should. So um, that's my short <laughs> answer to your question. Thank you. That's actually opened an interesting point, which I'm going to take up later, but I'll move on to Les to give us your understanding of racism. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Again, I just say this is such a, an important conversation to continue. And uh, I mean, when I think of racism, I just think of the devaluing of another race and almost like a, you know, like a superior attitude from other races, putting down on dishonoring another race. And uh, so my, you know, my heart is to, um, is very anti-racism and uh, to come against that and to project another model. But I just see, you know, I, I just see this, almost like this false supremacy, you know, that people kind of take on themselves instead of, you know, as you know, the example Jesus gave us, just, you know, serving one another, lifting one another up, loving one another, honoring one another. So when I see the opposite of that, that's what I see is racism. Mm. Right, that's, it. that's really interesting. Thanks for that view, perspective, Les. And um, Leon? Um, it, I, was, I was really grateful um, that um, uh, Dr. Chucks and Les went first because it kind of gave a good, um, good intro to what I believe, and I was grateful that it agreed. Um, I, I, I think to, to add an addition, uh, racism is a spectrum. Um, I think, although it's um, systematic and um, it is definitely a superior, the idea of superiority, um, mm. it, is, it, is a, it is a spectrum of um, um, interwoven ideals and um, interwoven interactive um, standards that we have that I, that I believe it's rooted in fear. I believe it's mm, rooted in... Uh, there, there's something that comes to mind that says when love is absent, rules are necessary, right? And so I think the idea of it is rooted in the fear of, uh, we call it FOMO, you know, the fear of missing out, the fear of, um, of, of, of being afraid to see change and see things differently. And I think there's a spectrum of how uh, different ones may, uh, you know, give action to those spaces. Hmm. So racism is all that, that was said, but I think the root of it is important, at least one of the significant roots. And I think as well to understand that there is a broad spectrum of it to, uh, to bring into place as well. That's interesting. I think I'm going to take you up on the point around the spectrum because I'd like to dig a bit more and explore that, particularly within the church, because obviously within the church, you have a wide spectrum of people. So I'd be quite keen to understand how you feel or how we all on the panel feel that plays out in a church community kind of setting. But I'll let Colin also, given interestingly enough, you're from a, a slightly different um, background and um, demographic. It'd be interesting to see what, what your perspective of racism is. Oh, there we go. To me, racism means being denied the right to be you, hmm. being denied opportunities to be on the same playing field with someone maybe of your superiority in terms of maybe economics or hmm. in our case in South Africa, I mean, we're coming from a really, 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 really um, 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 bad past, which racism still prevails even today you know 27 28 years later in our dem into our democracy um we still live um you know um, um, um with real racism rearing its head time mm. and again where even when we as you know blacks are the majority in the country but the minority has about 92 percent of the economy <laughs> and wow. Even today, um, the odds are not adding up for black people and we leave that every day. And actually I'm, I was just excited to be called and to be part of, 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 the, of, 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 of the panel because it's something that is really close to our heart. Um, and also just having traveled a bit well, uh, being to the US and uh, being to the UK as well, we, 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 there's things that we've seen that kind of like say, oops, they are also experiencing this. We're not the only ones. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but to us, to, to me rather, racism just means, you know, uh, being denied the right to live your life fully and 
you know, be able to be on the same playing field with um, other races. Yeah. So, I mean, across everyone who's spoken, one of the recurring themes I find is something around, you know, injustices. And even though it's rather, it's been expressed rather subtly, um, but nonetheless, what we've actually seen have been more active and more aggressive injustices and violence even against people of other races. Um, do we, I mean, I'm just going to throw it out there. Do we think that all these things that you've mentioned actually end up leading to violence? And uh, maybe not all the time, because I know that you've already mentioned it, Chooks, that sometimes we misidentify what racism is, but nobody's actually touched on the violence that sometimes results from racism. So what do we think, you know, kind of ends, results in that kind of um, action coming out of perceptions, mindsets, prejudices, and people being at different ends of the racial spectrum, quote unquote? Um, well, well, from my point of view, I don't know what everyone else thinks. Um, from the just just tackling that violence that you mentioned, it's in a way look as sad as sad as last year was, you know, in the US mm. with everything that transpired, and you know, a lot of us are still still feeling the aftershocks of of that. And to be honest, a lot of people haven't recovered, um, and a lot has happened since then. Um, and like you said, the church has gone quiet. It's gone quiet now, um, which is mm, interesting. Yeah. Um, but I think violence that we saw, um, George Floyd was brutally murdered in the daylight, cold-blooded. Um, it's almost easier to, you see that and you think, actually, it, it's there. The violence is, is there. You can, you can see it for what it is. You know, you can call a spade a spade. It was clear, it was recorded. Um, I think... I think when you don't get violence, you get like the systemic racism, which mm -hmm. is, you know, it's which probably is more of the case in the UK, um, where you actually get systems and institutions. You know, I work in healthcare, you know, that mm -hmm. it, it underpins a lot of the legislation and a lot of the hierarchies and power structures within these organizations. You know, that's a lot harder than, I mean, violence, you can, if someone says that, you know, I remember when I was in, um, how old was I, 13, I went to my friend's house and she, and he said, just to let you know, my grandma is racist. She doesn't like black people. I'm just telling you that now. And it was, it was at least I could go in there and know that she's racist. You know, it's very clear. I think when, when people say they're not or when it's hidden or it's masked, I think that's a lot more challenging personally. Um, but that's just to touch on what you said there about violence. Hmm. Absolutely. Um, I would like to add briefly to that. Um, violence is the fruit of um, this, this, this systemic space. So um, violence, whether, it, whether it's what's occurred with George Floyd or violence in impoverished um, areas that, that hadn't gotten the same tax paying dollars um, a release to that demographic and violence occurs because of economic stress. Mm. Violence is still the fruit mm. in both cases, is still the fruit of um, what's really going on. And, and so whether that violence is a person in context, is a person at home um, who is, who's, who's gathering firearms to protect their home out of fear to protect their home from the burglar. And so mm. violence occurs when the fear meets the thing it's been prepared for, you know? Right. So mm -hmm. I think in reality, the violence can be distracting um, because it's, it can be short lived, especially in this social climate that we see. I mean, in 10 minutes, a thing is over because another thing has occurred. Taken over. But, uh, but to take, <laughs> but to t use it as fuel, uh, but to know that it's quickly burning fuel and we still mm. need to deal with the root of what it is and what that's needs right. to be changed. So, yeah, I just wanted to add mm. that. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, you've mentioned the root and um, Dr. Chooks alluded to systemic racism, which is something that is on a lot of people's lips. I hear people say this all the time with different understandings of what it really means. And I'm, I'm not even sure my understanding may be the correct one, but... Given that that's one of the roots of what tends to result in violence, you know, prejudices and injustices, do we think that we see systemic racism in the church? Because I remember I've got a lot of Caribbean, Afro-Caribbean um, 
friends in the UK whose parents came like in the Windrush generation and they've told stories of how they were discriminated against they were not they were they basically were unwelcome in the white churches when they came they had to set up their own churches and set up their own banks and set up their own institutions so at the time they came the church was actually racist to them now I don't know if that's still the case today I go to a diverse church and I've never seen racism in my church that may not be everyone's story but I'm quite keen to know I mean to explore should I say unpack the question if systemic racism is a thing in the church and if so how can we tackle it given that obviously things like this lead to a lot more um grievous consequences if, if one could say that I may never jump in like this but I will jump in on this one <laughs> um, I believe um quickly that um, there is systemic racism um, in the church. Um, right. Fruitfully, it's systemic because of social economic status, because of um, there's a difference when the mindset of a 3,000 member um, African American church is looked to in a lesser context than a 500 member white church, just systematically. Uh, systemically, right. excuse me, that space is in us and, and not necessarily addressed, but let's really dive into the culture. Um, my the, the thing that I would put, the pushback thing that I would put on the table is that most multicultural churches um, are not are not diverse in culture. They're only diverse in, in, in superficial facial connection, which is usually the minority uh, acclimating to the culture of what the superior culture is, whether it be music, arts, speaking style, presence, so on and so forth. It's evolved a bit, but that's where it is systemically. So mm. it's coming from, again, it's a spectrum. And so it's coming from a lot of different angles. Mm. And, and to, your, to your point, which is really valid, do you, re do you reckon that it's an, a utopia or an unattainable thing to have a truly diverse church, which is not just diverse because there are black and white and Asian people there, but because everyone's equally represented in the music, in the preaching style, in, in everything, you know, that goes along the culture, if you like, of the church. Is that attainable, do you reckon? Because what I find is if, well, I, I'm, I'm Nigerian, I was born in the UK, I used to go to a predominantly black church, and there was hard, there was very, very few white people that came to the church. But when they came, you know, we suddenly felt diverse. But the truth is, their presence didn't change the fact that we sang African songs, right? So, more, give or take that, that it didn't really make a difference um but there are some churches where you know you've got the different colors you've got the different faces but then that somehow trying to have a unified culture trying to have a unified sound and i know people are trying desperately but it feels like a utopia so what what do we and and i know there might be churches who couldn't be bothered but i also know there are some churches with a good heart who really want to embrace you know all the different people the different cultures that are represented not just by having one annual event bring your natural your national meal and dress in your national clothing but on a day-to-day week-to-week basis be responsive and be engaging on those levels do we think that actually it's unattainable um yeah i don't know what you guys think but we're still on the systemic racism question but i thought i'd just throw that out there i don't know if leon sorry if les because i know leon you've spoken if les wants to chip in as well <laughs> Uh, you're on mute, Leon. Uh, I keep saying Leon. You're on mute, Les. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, Got this you. is my dream. This is actually my dream. You know, that we, oh, see, wow. we see the um, every tribe, tongue, and nation on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah. You know, so we pray, you know, we pray, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That's we pray in the Lord's prayer, and uh, so for me, I, you know, the worship of heaven is every tribe, tongue, and nation together. So my dream is to see that happening on earth as it is in heaven, and do everything that we can to to make to see that happen. You know, my it, again, it just says in Isaiah that my the my house will be called a house of prayer mm. for for all nations. Mm. And uh, so I believe you know God's house. That's his heart. That that um, the all nations are praying together and worshiping together, and mm. uh, so I think obviously the leadership of trust of church needs to be very intentional and um, about it, and uh, just to find you know 
you know, say like your church, you know, in, in Catford, you know, it's the, very intentional about bringing the cultures together, making the nations mm. welcome. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the thing I also have been thinking about a lot is, you know, in Ephesians 3, it says the manifold wisdom of God will be made known through the church. And the word manifold, um, it's only used one other place in the, in the Bible, and, and it means uh, it's talking about it. Uh, Joseph's coat of many colors. Wow. The, and uh, and so the, the manifold wisdom of God is it's like a multicolored wisdom of God. Mm -hmm. and, and that will be made known through the church. And so so that's yeah, that's what I'm believing for. And also um yeah, I mean I, I believe that's God's heart. God's heart mm -hmm. is that we, that we come together and uh, yeah. we worship together. And um, yeah, and the, and the nations are welcome, and the nations are unified, and uh, and this the big this we get it's a long way to go, Sarah. You know, long way to go in places, and and even where Colin's from in South Africa, you know, it's just very different as well, and different journeys, and um, but going you know going from diversity into inclusion into integration, yep, you know. Yeah. Uh, Colored people in leadership, you know, a multicultural church. But I, br I believe that, you know, <clears throat> just that picture in heaven of, of the nations worshiping together, you know, that for us to see that on earth is the kingdom of God. Mm. But I feel like achieving that, there's many stumbling blocks in the way. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I've put this um, sort of panel together is to address what we perceive to be the stumbling blocks of achieving this and then how we could potentially start removing those. Obviously, this is not going to be the be all and end all, but hopefully people who are watching and seeing this can take things away, can take away points and start adopting them in their individual churches and communities. Um, so to your point, Les, you know, it's God's heart that we all come together in unity, in oneness, praying, lifting our voices in praise and in worship. But then Leon has made, um, pointed out a valid um, issue, which is, in many churches, we are coming in, we are quote unquote diverse, but then we're not really integrated or it, the inclusion isn't there. So some subset of the congregation is having to adapt to the other majority. And how do we think that that can actually be addressed? If, if I mean, for example, I go to a church and all that is sung, like in my previous um, predominantly black church was African music. Um, interestingly enough, actually, I take that back. We did sing a lot of CCM and things like that, but by and large you knew that if you were the white person that you were the minority so how can we address that if it was a flip side as well where you're the, the one or two black people in the white church or the 10 percent of black people in a predominantly white church how can we be conscious in addressing the issue of not just diversity but inclusion and integration so that people feel like they're a part of a family and not just a number to meet a quota of you know the requirements to be diverse does that make sense um, I, I think it starts with willing hearts and from the leadership. Um, like, for instance, in South Africa, uh, most of the mega churches are actually um, I'm led by white pastors. But you find that there's predominantly a, 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 a congregation of black people. But hmm. when you get into the leadership structures, you find that um, the board is totally white. I'll make Why do you think that is? That's very interesting. Look, we have to be honest about it. Like in South Africa, we are still leaving, um, unfortunately, you know, the past truths that we thought democracy would bring. But in the church as well, what you see happening, just like in, in, in the world, we see also happening in the church mm -hmm. that uh, we're still segregated. Um, black people are still used, you know, as, 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 as pawns to say, like, we are doing well. But where, where, when it comes to leadership structures, where mm -hmm. things matter most, where they, they're supposed to voice uh, out their, their, their opinions and so forth, um, they're not really heard. Uh, I'll make an example. B Bill Hybels came to the country, I think about four or five years ago, and we attended a leadership seminar that he had. Actually, I was singing at the le leadership seminar with a, with, with, with a band at uh, one of his churches. And he had, the, 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 there were white pastors and there were also black pastors, you know, because everybody wants to hear about his success story, how he managed to get Willow Creek where it is. And one thing that he said, he says, I met with most of you pastors here and your leaders, 
But the hurting thing is to see that every time I meet with white people in their um, 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 boards and so forth, there is barely, you know, black people in their boards, yet their congregation is 90% black people. So wherever they've been set up uh, uh, strategically, black people go in there, but there is no leadership uh, uh, represented uh, in terms of, 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 of the, the, the majority um, or bre- uh, black people. But it starts with leaders who are willing to push Christ's mandate, not their own, not the, not, not the politics of South Africa, not the history of South Africa, mm-hmm. not the injustices of the past, but we need leaders that are willing to, you know, have, 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 have a bit of a thick skin because, yes, every time they step, there are those that are really doing very well, though they're few that are saying, you know what, we are tired of this, we're tired of uh, black people being discriminated against, and they step up to the plate and say, this is how they want to do things, but mm-hmm. then they are, all, they are also p- uh, uh, sidelined by, by, by by, 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 by their brothers, if I have to put it that way. Mm-hmm. But we need leaders that have thick skin that are willing to say, you know what, I'll put my, my body on the block. Because Christ died for all of us. Mm-hmm. Christ did, like, like Mr. Les said, you know, it's, it's, it's God's heart's desire to see everybody being the same. Love you, your, your, your neighbor as you love yourself. It doesn't say love some neighbors. It says love mm-hmm. your, your neighbor as you love yourself. And you, mm-hmm. your, neighbor. your neighbor is anyone that you see with your eye, whether it be black, mm-hmm. Indian, colored, and so forth. It mm-hmm. takes leaders that are willing to step, you know, enough with talking, you know, on the pulpit and all that, but take action. For instance, we even say, Close your church on a Sunday. Go to where black people are instead of them coming to you. So, because- so are the churches? Sorry to interrupt you. There are the churches that you're talking about more in a sort of white um, demographic yeah. as opposed yeah. to black communities. As That's a, very as, interesting. As opposed to black communities, they will send the buses, you know, to get it, go and get black people. But right. in the leadership, there is no black people. Right. Do you think that just- maybe a ch- sorry? Go, go, Chip, no, no, go ahead. Go on, sorry. Go no, 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 on, it's fine. On. No, no, this is your. This is fine. You go. I just wanted to uh, just a couple of things that have been said. Um, so, thank you, Leon, just for for mentioning basically the um, that idea that you know a smaller white church versus a larger black church. You know, that's kind of the that's the journey I took. Actually, I went. I grew up in an all white um, church. We were the only first West African. Um, people to attend the church first West African family then uh, over the next 10 years we found the church changed and it became a predominantly black church but the leadership didn't change um, it stayed exactly the same it was not representative of the church now um, we got to a point where on the stage I was playing the drums and you had a few um, you know black singers but the pastor was white you know uh, at the, in the back of my mind I'm thinking hmm if you then have a black person on stage, all of a sudden it becomes a black church. You're so it was, right. It, it was their You're way of gate. It was their way of gatekeeping, um, yeah. um, and they, they felt uncomfortable relinquishing the power to black mm. people, which which I had a big issue with. Um, you know, and I think what's made this worse is you know one mm. of my favorite people. He's never met me, but I always listen to what he has to say online. His name's David Shoshanya. He says you can't go swimming and not get wet. As black people, we can't live in a society that white people are kind of rule, rule. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's first put it and not start to internalize the negative things about you as a black person. You know, I think I think black people, whether we like it or not, um, we still have an inferiority complex, and you know the idea of um, you know. We were completely comfortable being in an all black church and having a white um, leader. You know, how many white churches do you have that have a black leader? You know, you just won't see it. Now, I think you asked the question, is it attainable? Is it is true multiculturalism or true, um, you know, true integration attainable in the church? Mm. <laughs> I'm sorry to put a downer on Les. I think what you said was fantastic. Everyone needs to be intentional, but I think it's incredibly difficult, almost impossible, because what mm. you're requiring is you're requiring people to fully accept and fully understand, fully engage with other people's culture. And unfortunately, outside of the four walls of church, people, even in London, I live in Southeast London, it's very diverse. 
when people leave the church, you might go to a mixed church, or when people leave the four walls of church, often what you find is people go in, in their silos. You know, the white people hang with white people, the black people hang with black people. You know, I can count on two hands the number of white people that have come through the front door of my family house growing up. Like, my parents just didn't have white... We went to a mixed church, but they just didn't have white friends. That was just the reality of it. You know, I'm sure it's a similar situation in, in the US, you know, where... and. and I, I don't know. I, I just I, it, it gets so tricky when you talk about as a topic like this. Mm. You know, people. You know, you don't want to put a downer on it, but you know, but we still have it, to be it, real and factual about the situation. Yeah, it's yeah. very, very challenging for like you. Uh, for if I found it very interesting when you said you've never had any racism in your church. In your church. Well, not that I'm aware <laughs> of. No, not that because I'm thinking I mean, in my head. I'm because uh, I'm thinking. Mm, my, but you know the thing is, is let, let me yeah. let me let me let me say a bit about myself because that probably would shed a bit of light on the comment I made. I'm one of those people. Um, my 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 worldview is slightly different from most people, but I believe that people are people. People can be nasty, right? If somebody's nasty to me, I don't always put it down to racism just because they're white, right? But some people cannot have a white person be rude to them. They'll say they're racist. I'm not one of those people right so I could be in any place and a white person could come to me as long as they don't call me any you know derogatory names if they're being rude nasty or impolite I just put it down to them being that kind of I person know, because so... they could have been a black person so that said no no to your, to your question that said mm. I haven't necessarily had people be nasty to me in my church mm. for example yeah. um, but no, that doesn't mean that they may not be um you know, arguments, frictions, disagreements amongst other people, but that may not necessarily be due to racism. I don't know. Mm. I've not been involved in any of those conversations, but this is my, my viewpoint. And I'm one of those people who tends to give people the benefit of the doubt until it's very blatantly mm. obvious that I may be wrong. I'm one of those people that tends to just be like, hmm, I give you, I give you excuses for whatever you do until it's blatantly obvious that you're doing something completely different. And then I'm like, okay, I think we need to call it here. But yeah, I'm, I'm different, I guess. But anyway, you're you know, saying... I, no, 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 and I think that's good. I think that's really good. My dad always, sorry, Leon. My, my dad always always said, you know, it's so important to give people excuses. You know, you know, if yeah. someone turns up late, people say, oh my goodness, why are they late? But actually, so you just say, you know, they could have been caught up in some, you know, give people, re you know, excuses. It's, it's, I think it's a Christian thing to do. But there does come a point where, for ex this is the example I like to use. I used to be very late, like late to everything, like seriously late, <laughs> to the point that when I'm on time, people make funny comments or if I'm actually, I've been early a couple of days and then I'm late again, or I'm late for a genuine reason, people are like, oh, he's late. And I get annoyed. What do you mean? I actually had a reason this time, but I, I, can't, I, haven't, I don't have a leg to stand on because I'm always late. You know, if, if, if someone gets annoyed, like you, what you find is black people, because often they can get, um, they can feel very snappy, like, oh, oh, this person's racist, this person's racist, when you're right, Sarah, it might not necessarily be racism, but they've reached the point where they've experienced so much racism in and outside of the church, that actually, they they find it hard to distinguish between what is, you know, <laughs> what's what, and I think it's their, the person who, it's up to us to want to identify and appreciate and empathize with that person who has been on the receiving end of so much racism. Mm -hmm. um, and you're right, it might be small, it might be small, it might not be noticeable. For example, in your church, there might be microaggressions or there might be, uh, you know, you might be talking about systemic situations. I don't know the ins and outs of your church. You live in a really diverse area of London, so it's just fantastic. Um, but I, I just feel like I, I sympathize with people who, you know, paint everything as racism. I, I just mm. sympathise with that because they've experienced so much that actually, it, you know, it, it's hard. It's hard to distinguish what's what. So um, that's just my little addition there. <laughs> yeah. I feel like Leon was going to say something. Yeah, I'm, I'm bubbling over here. Ah, okay. Fray tell. <laughs> Why so? <laughs> um, a, a few things. I am, I'm learning the fruit of the spirit, patience. Um, I am... Ah. You know when you're in a good conversation, and um, I just I just want to so I'm, I'm gonna get to it. Two things two things that come up to me first. Um, there are problems, um, problems, and there are tensions. Problems are to be solved, and tensions are to be managed. Sarah, I believe 
that what we've done is we've we've tried to solve tensions and man, uh, and manage problems. Um, and I think to answer your questions directly, I think that's that's not necessarily the question to ask. Is there going to be a utopia, right? I think the mm. question to ask is, is that a tension for the church to manage? Is the mm. church healthy enough? Because relationship isn't an absolute. Relationship mm. is the process of managing tensions to be, mm. it's like an ebb and flow. It's like a marriage, it's like a best mm. friend, it's like a thing, you know? Mm. And so I think the question to answer um, is how do we, in a healthy way, manage these tensions? I, I, mm. I, I think I think let's I'll add to my definition of racism. I, I believe racism is a is a spirit. I, re, I believe that racism is an energy. I believe that racism is an overarching, um, uh, uh, intangible, tangible thing. And I believe that we tend to forget that principality of you know perspective of it, so that when people adhere to that spirit, we forget that it is it was it was there before they agreed to it. It was mm. already there. It's already moving. It's already breathing. Right. And so I think sometimes we see people in ways that we shouldn't because love should still build from us in our mm. interaction while we're identifying what they're submitting to. So I, I believe that is that's that's the first thing when it comes to your church and the people of it. And I'm walking on eggshells here because I don't know things specifically. I would say that racism exists in your space because of the energy, because of the spirit of that space that's given a lot of your um, your, your your counter congregants um, their position, um, their, their space. Two places that Blacks are usually hired, Blacks, um, I usually hired. It is, and forgive me if this seems a bit aggressive, but it is either uh, entertain us or watch our kids. When a when a multicultural church tends to lean into diversity, the first place they speak of hiring leadership mm. is either in the music department or the children's ministry. You are good enough to watch our kids or entertain us and do our music, but not to sit on the boards and make decisions to manage those tensions. Now that's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. And so that's, that's, mm. that's, that was all that was bubbling in me. While we were hmm. well, and yeah. how, and I, I'm going to take you up on that actually. So how do you think we can address that? Because one of the points Colin obviously raised is around not having, you know, representation of interestingly enough, the majority of the demographic in the church in leadership. And you've also touched on that, Leon, and I find that to be a case, you know, in the UK as well. And, you know, Dr. Chooks mentioned if that one white person who's actually the pastor of the church was suddenly replaced by a black pastor. Now the church is now a is labeled a black church just because the leader has, has been switched from from white to black. Um, so given that we do want to get to a place where in, in Dr. Chooks scenario, the pastor is actually black, given the majority of the, of the congregation are black. Why don't we, what, what can we do to get to that sort of um, position or state, if you like? Martin Luther King speaks to the moderate white in, the, in, the, in his letters from a Birmingham jail. He speaks to the moderate white to be um, the most dangerous. And this is after the I Have a Dream speech. This is mm -hmm. uh, years later when he, he realized and stated that I Have a Dream speech was a nightmare because what I faced after that, I would have probably not spoken it. Um, right. So the, the reality is um, when, when, when that happens, okay, um, it, it's a bit personal for me hmm. because I have, a lot of, uh, I have a lot of friends from different cultures, a lot of white brothers. Now, when I sit in restaurants with my white brothers, we have a code. I'm gonna let y'all in on code, okay? I'm gonna let y'all. I'm gonna put y'all up on game. So <laughs> we're talking about some of our tensions. I say, um, um, well, to to Dr. Chucks, I, I say, well, you know, beautiful people are always told that they come in late. It's called colored people time. But wonderful people. They can come in late and they always have an excuse. I just put you up on code. I don't know if you caught it. 
So if you're in a restaurant, <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. I got you, Liz. I got you, Liz. If you're in a restaurant and you're like, I'm just sick of wonderful people. I'm done. This is all the wonderful people. I'm sick of you. Nobody's offended. Everybody's still drinking their tea and your friend understands life moves at the speed of relationship. Right. Yeah. And that is your solution, Sarah. Your solution mm. is I'm going to believe you even if I don't understand what you're doing. I'm going to mm. trust this tension even mm. if I there's nothing wrong with white pastors who want diverse churches with white boards. Why? Because people flock and lean to their comfort. But I believe that comfortability is an enemy of God. Mm. And so it is easy for us to just lean. It's like a gravitational pull to lean to your brother or your cousin that looks the way you look. It takes intentionality to speak mm. to those spaces consistently and manage that tension. If you, mm. if you choose to let it manage you, you're going to end up with boards the way we're speaking it. But the only way yeah. we're going to look like heaven is if we create a resting place for heaven to show up. And that mm. looks like intentionally pushing those tensions and making space where, where spaces aren't going to happen by themselves. Mm -mm. That's, a, that's an interesting point that you raised. I'm going to let Les jump in because I felt like he was going to say something earlier. Yeah, this is so good. This uh, conversation as in but, um, Leon, you know, we talked about earlier about being on the spectrum, as in, you know, so where are we at? You know, if, so if the dream is a multicultural church, the nation's pushing together uh, today, where are we at on that journey? Do you mean, and if we're um, saying really that, you know, are we on like a two or a three, or are we... Hmm. You That's mean, interesting. <laughs> you mean, or where are we in it? Do you mean where, where I think we are, um, and you can and you can finish, Les. Where, where I think we no. are, I think we're we we're, we're definitely at a two or a three, and and, and this is why I I say we are there um, because there hasn't in any of our countries there hasn't been outside. I actually am in partnership with a um, with a black pastor with a multicultural church in Los Angeles, Albert Tate. He does a lot with Willow Creek now. I, I love him. He we have a we have a uh, center for racial reconciliation that's really aggressive. Uh, that that right now there was an Asian American tour to kind of uh, take take uh, different cultures into the Asian American process in this country. Prior to that, there was an African American tour where they went to Memphis and they went to New Orleans and they went to plantations wow. and mm. a lot of different cultures. And if you're not intentional about that space, this is it. The reason why I say a two or three, because number one, he's a black pastor leading a multicultural congregation and white flight was guided by love, which is what you're going to deal with when a black pastor usually uh, takes, you know, takes the helm at in a congregation. You're going to deal with white flight. The moderate white usually leaves because it's mm. going to take a little work for them to stay and become. Yeah. So I, yeah. that, that's why mm -hmm. I say, and even the successes we're finding out with Fellowship Church in LA is still one man who's spreading this idea, but it's not enough for me to give it any more, you know, of a point system concerning that. Is, mm -hmm. is, is the church still amazing? Does God still work his grace through us as one body? Are we, are we, are we, have we love, are we loving each other more than we ever have? I believe we are, but I have to be transparently honest about mm -hmm. where we are in terms of intentional, intentional input into this space. Of yeah, yeah. But, but how oh. can we claim to be loving one another if we're subtly prejudiced against one another? Because if we say a, a mm -hmm. church, we have white flight in the church because it suddenly has a black leader, I don't know how that's reflective of the love of Christ. Do we really understand what it means to have the mind of Christ if we have issues with somebody who's not our race and more so white on black in this perspective, being the head of a church and potentially even black. I suspect the church that Chooks mentioned, for example, once the pastor became black, some black people might not even want to go there anymore, but they're like, oh my God, now it's a black church. So why, why are we that way? Why are we wired to potentially look down on one particular race um, over the other? And and how is that even reflective of the love of God? Because that I find as an is an issue. The spirit um, and the spectrum of racism. But please continue. I'm sorry. 
Mm. Uh, look, coming from South Africa and um, having, um, okay, I've been born again now 24 years, I'm going to an, on my 25th year, mm. and having grown out of, you know, um, 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 the apartheid system, and you, you, you expect the church to be the one at the forefront in championing, making sure that the country is united. But mm. most of the time, the church is quiet, especially the white leaders. I'm not saying all of them. There are those that are trying, believe me. But majority of them are quiet on 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 issues of race. It it, it seems as if um um they prioritize their race more than Christ. Mm -hmm. And once you do you, you you do that, then you 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 kind of put yourself in mute mode about Christ because you have to please the 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 majority of who you're flocking with, birds of the same feather, and all that. Um. So it's 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 it, until it's until we see white leaders in South Africa come up front and say, "Hey, you know what? We have to deal with this," and not just say it from the pulpit, but get into initiatives that will make sure like we breach the gap and bring blacks and whites together so that we can mm. start. Um, you know, bringing healing into the country. I mean, 27 years is a long time. And mm -hmm. for me to see the same things that I saw back then when I was still a kid happening even today, you know, that is really, really something else. Because it just shows that, look, we come into um, the building as uh, so-called uh, 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 interracial. But when we mm -hmm. leave the building, we go back to our tables where things are said on how to, you know, deal with blacks. I'll make an example. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a, a Christian um, 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 artist, like he's very big and he's white. One day we're working with him and we're driving with him like about two hours out of uh, 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 um, our state, uh, which is uh, called Gauteng or Pretoria, the capital city. As we're driving out, he's got his two children there. Uh, they are both girls. The other one mm. I think was seven. The other one was nine. And we, he drives them uh, to this place that we saw on the news. And nothing good was said about the place. Actually, this place, um, you know, was even investigated for racially kind of, you know, indoctrinating young white people to look at blacks as thugs, to look at blacks Oh, my as goodness. And these are things that we're living with. This is our reality. And this is a Christian um, um, artist that we're supporting that at the time I was a backing vocalist of. And we asked him, Mr. So-and-so, isn't this the same place that was on the news and, you know, for all the bad reasons kind of, you know, he's like, no, yes, it is. And we're like, okay, but do you think it's right for you to bring your kids here? He says, look, it's your business as black people if you want to leave sort of your culture and your tradition, but we are going to go on with what we believe in. And we ask them about Christ. Hmm. So what about Christ who we are all proclaiming to be, you know, our, our, our leader, to be, to, to, to be our God, to be our savior. Mm. And he was mum about that. He kind of got a, a bit of a pause. And that was the last time we worked with him anyway. Oh, wow. But, but until we prioritize Christ. Over mm -hmm. This is it. Opposite. Yes. Until we do that, then we will be able to, to bring healing into the body of Christ. But mm. as we talk right now um a lot of our black pastors are the ones that are reaching out to the white people are reach, reaching out to the white pastors um 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 but they, they 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 seem to be having it okay um having you know their high walls and having you know this walls built between us as as as, as black and white but i cannot mm -hmm. wait for that day that uh, uh Les was talking about where god sees us all as one until mm. that happens, you know, we will we will get to experience healing in our country. We'll get to experience healing, you know, within the races or between the races. But mm. uh, we, that we need we. Need, but I thank God for a platform like this because this is just a step, uh, you know, a start in the right direction to say let's mm. talk about things. Let's talk about our discomforts. Let's talk about our pains. Even the conversations that are very uncomfortable, those are the ones actually that we should be talking about. Mm -hmm. And we don't get to talk about these on the pla on the pulpit. No, these no racial care. topics never get touched, and otherwise you lose half your church this, the next week. <laughs> this is this this is part of this is. Thank you, Colin. By the way, I think um, your perspective from South Africa is just mind blowing. You know, mm. some of the stuff that's happened there is just wow, quite quite astounding. But um, yeah, what you're saying, Sarah, is so true. I think first step, you know, we've talked about what the problems are and we can't even scratch, yeah. scratch the surface in just this short time we have today. There's yeah. so, the problem is, as Leon's kind of high, uh, alluded to, it, it's so vast that you almost feel like, you know, God, just help, help us. Mm -hmm. But I think, the, well, I think one of the things we have to do is we need to talk about it. I think we literally just need to 
talk mm -hmm. about it. I think black people are so used to talking about race. And, yeah. you know, I, and, and, you know, we talk about being black in so many different ways and we don't even realize we're doing it. I think I notice it a lot when I'm with my white friends and we just talk about, we just say black, white, we throw those words around. White people still find it uncomfortable saying black, saying white. Um, mm. and I think we need to just talk about it a lot more. I mm. was doing some, um, I was doing some thinking and I remember in 2004 in the UK, they made it voluntary as in they stopped it being compulsory to learn another language at GCSE mm. for, you, for those of you guys that don't know GCSE is like the <laughs> kind of exams you take around the age of 16 so in 2004 they stopped it being compulsory to learn another language now the thing with learning another language I actually thought that was a really bad move for all sorts of reasons but the thing with learning another language is that it opens up your horizons Mm. It, it, you know you know yeah. it's quite it's quite difficult it's possible but it's quite difficult for an Englishman to hate French people if he can speak fluent French yes and, so you, know, right. and, 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 you know and goes to Paris every you know twice a year you know it's just this is the reality and I think unless we start to immerse you know immerse people in what it means to be black, what it means to be other, immerse people in mm. so they almost start to speak the language they can. And you know, look, not everywhere is going to be like London or Manchester where you have a lot of black mm -hmm. people. I'm aware that the vast majority of the UK is white. You know, they're not going to yeah. come across a black person. So, you know, of course their leadership is going to be white. Of course they're not going to be exposed to. But it's not about how often you come across a black person. It's about you might never travel to France, but you might be able to speak French. It's about opening your perspective, opening up your mm. horizons, understanding, mm -hmm. you know, increasing that level of love. You know, Peter, who we love in the Bible, you know, he, he was challenged by God. He said, no, 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 mm. no, no. It's time for you to change your perspective. Gentiles are now, you, they're, they're, they're completely fine. They're completely you know, fine. Yeah, yeah, you've hit on a topic, which I don't even know if we're going to have enough time to, to kind of unpack. But I'll let, I'll let Les say what he's going to say and then I'll, I'll talk. Yeah, just, just two quick things. Um, Dr. Chooks, um, I had a thing at Christmas, which was interesting. Um, you know, the song "Oh Holy Night." Um, I found out this love, Christmas. That love it, that song. Was, <laughs> yeah, but it was actually the nation UK's favorite Christmas carol. Mm. And I found out uh, this year, I didn't. I was probably a little naive that that was originally written in French. <gasps> okay. Wow. Wow. And and so and then I started finding out like "Silent Night" was originally written in German. You know. How great the art was written in Swedish. Wow, and it was written, in, and it's just these songs from the nations, and then, and obviously the last year and a half for the white church, I mean we have been totally blessed with Waymaker. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Do you mean which is this song? Can, can, can I just, uh, Les? I'm gonna interrupt you there, and the only reason is because I feel like you have huge credit for that. If you don't mind us telling the world how that happened and how you really have credit for pushing that song from Africa to the world. I'm not going to let you go without, honestly, this guy is a legend. Anyway, Les, over to you. <laughs> no, in, in 2017, I had the privilege of going to Lagos. And uh, it's a pretty crazy place. But when I, when I was there, I started to really discover more and more African worship and what songs were coming from there. And, and through that, I got to hear about Sinatch and then I heard the song Waymaker. I mean, it was already like an anthem in Africa and yeah. a lot of like majority yeah. churches. So, but I, I brought it back and I saw, no, this song is for the world. It's not just for the, you know, the African culture. This song is for the, the whole church. And so I started to, to put it on different albums, compilation albums and introduce it then. And my friend called Leland, you know, Leland, he wanted to, he asked me if I had some songs for his new album. And so I actually presented him with five songs and he went with, um, he recorded Waymaker. Wow. And then, and wow. then he also, he actually also recorded Rain. Mm -hmm. Yes. No Robinson, 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 yeah. 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 He also recorded these songs. And, uh, and, and the interesting thing with Rain was 10 years old, mm. but, he, but it was fresh to him. But it was something mm. from the black majority churches in the UK mm. that have now gone to bless the nations. In fact, I think yes. Leon had to be singing at Potter's House, the rain. Yes. There. Yes. And so, um, and, and so even, and, uh, and then when Leland, uh, you know, he, he's very close to Michael W. Smith, Michael W. Smith recorded it. 
and then Darlene Check and William McDowell recorded it. And uh, so Waymaker has now become this anthem. <laughs> this Thanks to you, Les. No, 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 But it's become this anthem around, but it's come from Africa. Yes, 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 so, yes, yes. And then, and then this is a little crazy dream that my, my boss and I had. You know, when they, when they had, uh, um, you know, the credits at the bottom of a song, especially, mm. you know, on the at church, you know, when they have the lyrics. Yes. And yes. they have this name at the bottom. And our dream was that the, the white church wouldn't know how to pronounce the, the name. Oh, the name. <laughs> <laughs> I get and that at church on Sundays and they sing it, it, yes. And then, <laughs> and then when they, and the wonderful thing was they put Sinatra's African name, yes, on, on the bottom of the credits. Wow. So and even, <laughs> and then we had this crazy thing in, in on Billboard, you know, where her, um, she was the number one uh, Christian gospel songwriter on Billboard for twelve weeks. Yes. Mm -hmm. So there's all these names, Chris Tomlin, Jason Ingram, all these, Michael W, all these names. And then there was this African Sinatch at, at the top. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So, <laughs> mean, so there's just moments like that where the, where this the song goes ahead and that people mm. realize what so is good. happening in the nations. Mm. Oh, thank you. you mean, that's, thank and you so just, this is a blessing to them. So yeah. I just think God's, I think it's just a trip, but that's, I mean, Waymaker is just a trailblazer. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, there's yeah. so much more to come, you know. And, um, and, the thing, and, and the thing is, Les, the thing is, Les, I think, honestly, I don't, I, I, did you guys ever watch Power Rangers? Or I don't know whether you have. Yeah, you know, I, and my yeah. kids find it quite cheesy, but carry yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, you know at, at the end of Power Rangers, you have the Power Rangers come together and form this big power Massive, range that, yeah. that, 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 yeah, that takes yeah. out the this is how this is how the, the church hasn't yet reached its potential nowhere near mm. i think the white church uh, i told i think the white church broadly um I, i'm gonna say the white church broadly i think they really haven't understood how valuable the black church is and you've just given mm. a slight you've given a slight slight example there les about you know how music, just music, for example, music, the kind yeah. of, the kind of uh, you know, you know, powerful music you get from the whole continent. You know? Yeah, I, I, you know, you can't that you can't replicate it in certain, it, and it's just because it's not because it's you know their music's different or I mean better or anything. It's just because God's given different talents, given gifts. You know, cultures mm -hmm. are different. You know, we have to maximize. Oh, I don't know. I think because of my my uh, perspective of be, having been in two such varied churches, I just understand. Black, you know, you talk about you know, fifty percent of churchgoers in London are black. Fifty percent. Mm. You know, these are massive numbers, and there's only three percent that are in the Church of England clergy as it stands. Only three wow. percent. Well, know, I'm like glad I've got one of the Church of England priests on this panel one of the weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting to see his. Thanks for it, that it, statistic. I'm going to be asking him that wow. question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's uh, and you know, uh, I pray. I really pray because you're mm. absolutely right. We've heard, like for example, Colin said that there are white pastors in South Africa and elsewhere who are actually mm. real, have realized this finally yeah. it's starting to fall mm. on that actually they're, yeah. they're, they're missing a trick. You know, they're not, you know, it's mm. the times need to come to an end where you get, and this happened in my church where you get talented black people who are just shaking people's hands at the door and, you know, mm. looking after the, you know, and I'm not knocking that. I think hospitality is so important or, you know, de you know, working in the creche, so important, valuable work, but, you know, where's the representation on the stage in is, as mm. leaders? And, you know, mm -hmm. it comes, we need to, we need to move forward. And Sarah, thank mm. you for this discussion because I think mm. it's, <laughs> I, th I think, rich. I think, it's rich. yeah, it is. And, and, and in, in the interest of time, I know we've gone on to the hour and I did want to keep it to an hour. Before we ask Helen to show us what she's been painting, there's one thing that's come across from all the conversations because I always like to find a unifying thread. And I think it's intentionality. Yeah. And I say that because at the very start, Les talked about the dream. We were talking about, oh, it might be a utopia. We're thinking it might be impossible. 
But then he also talked about how he's managed to see that dream by seeing Sinatra's name coming on the credits amongst all these other big names. And that dream is because he was intentional about it. He was looking actively for songs from the black world, from the African community, African continent yeah. that could go out to the world. And I think that intentionality, maybe from this week's episode, is a word that we should take away, not just in the music, but in the clergy, in the leaderships where you've got a black majority church with white majority majority preachers I, I feel like my screen is frozen so i don't know what's going on and i don't want to do anything about it that would mess it up so if you're watching i didn't just put my picture there it's frozen and i don't know why but i'm just going to carry on but if you're not you know you're like a white pastor or a white church founder you've got this church which was handed over from your great grandfather to your grandfather to yourself and now it's full of black people and you're like how do i let this go we have to be intentional about it so what leon said as well about you know the different spectrums and the different you know ways of moving from diversity to inclusion to um, integration, it comes down to being intentional and thinking amongst ourselves, what can we actively do to change the narrative, to change the way that we're perceived? Because Colin mentioned that the change can come, should come from the church and spread through yeah. to the community. And one of the things I'm hoping we can do is whatever we take and adopt from these sessions can hopefully roll off into the community, into the wider, and basically go farther afield, you know? So I'm just gonna, before we take final words from everyone, um, and I know there's people commenting and, and asking questions on um, Facebook and um, YouTube as well. Um, I'm just gonna, let me just show um, one comment that just came up now. This is so insightful, <laughs> the hour went too quick. It felt like 10 minutes, wish we could keep going on because this is so, so good and valuable. Thank you, Sir Godi, wow. for the comment. And we've had a, a fair few comments, I can't show every single one. So thank you all on Facebook and YouTube for engaging and asking your comments as your questions and putting your comments through. I'm gonna just go around um, everyone on the panel to give their final words. But before we do that, I'm gonna let Helen show us what she has been painting <laughs> uh, let me unmute you helen you are you're muted you're muted sorry let me unmute you do i do that there you go yeah yeah I, you've done it I've been the mess wholeheartedly and so what i'm going to show you now this is simply the end result it's not it's not the finished thing because this is going to go on for four weeks so this picture will have many pictures on and I'm excited to see what the last picture will look like in week wow. four. The way that it started, it started with a pink elephant, you know, the pink elephant in the room. Like, I'm mm. so thrilled wow. that I'm speaking about this. Like, this is amazing. And so for me, I feel that God is really happy that we're talking about this. So there was some, mm. we're just talking about the church right now. Um, you know, there were some Christians who believe that, you know, Black Lives Matter, about the whole kind of, you know, um, race equality issues that were uprising back in the summer and they were saying it's a distraction it's it's this is that and I knew in my spirit straight away no this is the pink elephant in the room God's so happy he's so happy we're talking about this and mm. so it started with the pink elephant and then it went from the pink elephant into I felt to go to Acts chapter 6 to to where the early church dealt with racism and where you mm. had the speaking Jews and the Hebrew speaking Jews. So I had some widows who had nothing in their pots and I had some widows who had a lot in their pots. And I just mm. find the light of Christ into that situation. And um, and some of that for me as a singer, that would, that would be about me at times handing my microphone to somebody else. That mm. might be somebody giving something um, to somebody else. But, you know, that's how the people... That's how the church grew, because they saw the love we had one for another. Mm. And so I paint Acts 6, and then I brought light into the picture, and then um, then I came back to the elephants. And mm. I remember hearing once that when elephants are looking for water, when they're looking for the spirit to move, when they're looking for things to happen, um, they, 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 they walk in line with one another, and they pound the floor. And when they can feel there's water under the surface, that elephant will start to pound. I just want to say tonight, mm. Sarah, we're pounding the floor. And oh, glory. Pounding the floor. Other elephants come. Other elephants, they come into line because, you know, we're, we, we're all one in the spirit. So we start all pounding the floor until the water comes up. And, mm. until, and God says, behold, I do a new thing. Do you not perceive it? So it's going to happen in a new way. It's an old conversation. But God can do something in a new way if we continue to pound 
the floor and not let it be just as I said at the beginning about, well, we'll revisit this in another year. So that was the picture. And then we had all of this kind of colour, which exactly is what the Bride of Christ should look like. All Mm -hmm. of the colour coming forth. And then I think the last thing the Lord showed me was, um, you know, we're surrounded, we're hemmed in by the blood of Mm -hmm. Christ. Spirit, spirit, you know, ah, so Pentecost meets Acts chapter 6. Glory. So far, let's see what he does over the next few weeks. Woo! I am so Whoa. moved right now. I knew this was going to be a prophetic thing in the end. Glory to Go, God! This is on. awesome. I'm I'm so gutted you can't see my expression. I don't know why my my frozen my screen is frozen, but this is just amazing. <laughs> so so amazing. Wow, Thank you, not. Helen. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> you smashed it, Helen. You smashed uh. it. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to go from the top all the way down. Thank you so much, Helen. God bless you. And I'm really excited to see how this carries on evolving. Um, just very quickly, just get some final words. So I'm just going to go all the way from Chicks down through to, to Colin. Yeah. Um, sorry, guys. Just wanted to mention, just sorry about my use of a hat today. This uh, <laughs> lockdown. This lockdown. <laughs> yeah. and I, man, I haven't been able to get to Don't make an excuse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no excuses. My husband started shaving his head himself, so oh. you have no excuse. <laughs> no, no. Firstly, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Sarah, for uh, such a, a, a rich conversation. I'm sure we've had many of these conversations before, but like mm-hmm. I said at the beginning, I think this conversation is never—you never get tired of uh, of talking about it because there's so much work that has to be done. Thank you, Colin, uh, for, you know, South Africa, your perspectives, yeah. Leon, US. The issues are completely different, you know, completely different, but ultimately the same. This is why it's so tricky because, you know, the, the the political dynamics in in America are so different from US, likewise, South Africa. I find it, you know, you, you can only, you can't really, the perspectives are different. Um, let's put it that way. So, um, yeah, thank you so much. I've really taken a lot of things out of it but if there's one thing that I really want to um, leave with everyone it's the idea of it kind of would work both ways white people need to understand yes. the we the, the privilege which we haven't used that word today but the privileged in which they find themselves and I think the black people need to appreciate that they have <laughs> internalized they have internalized this um uh this inferiority um and this is in the church you know which is why they're completely satisfied we're completely satisfied being um in a all black church but with a white leader which is not a problem but there needs to be a better representation on the stage um and you know in power power positions so um but yeah, that's 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 what I would say. So we both we have everyone has work to do. So it's not just don't just see it's just white people have work to do, black people we have work to do as mm. well. And we need to we need to talk about these things more. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Les? Yeah. Um Sarah, yeah, thank you again for for allowing me to be part of this and um, I've learned a lot as well. I'm listening, I'm listening. And <laughs> I'm and I'm but I'm holding on to the dream. Mm, definitely. And the other thing, I was just like, I was looking at Helen's painting, and I was think, I was just thinking, the Church of Many Colors. Hallelujah! Glory to God! That's awesome. <laughs> Pushing it, it is. <laughs> oh, this is becoming something else. Hallelujah! <laughs> so the Glory bride is Jesus. looking radiant. The bride is looking radiant. Hallelujah! Oh. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! And it's Thank awesome you. that we see, we all see ourselves through this lens through the lens of being that robe of many colours that is prophetic. That's what the church really is. We're not meant to be one colour. We're meant to be multiple colours. And that's really, we need to be comfortable to see ourselves that way. Anyway, Leon, final words. Bless, I'm sorry. Can y'all hear me okay? Yes, yes. Awesome. Uh, Well, first of all, I want to say to you, Sarah, uh, (laughs) What a vision, what a platform you've created. Thank you so much for inviting me. I am honored to share and to learn. Um, also, Helen, you've, um, I, be, I was, because I'm a creative, I was kind of sneaking my eye over to the different 
phases of the painting. And, and I was actually shocked because I'd seen people, I'd seen the pink elephant. I'm like, now nah, she's got strips of rainbow. What is going on? <laughs> and so I, I kind of walked into those spaces with you, just kind of staring down, seeing how the tide was changing. Thank you <clears throat> for keeping us clear. Thank you for keeping us open. And um, mm. um, Les, you made a point to say, I still have the dream. Um, I want to say to, I want to say to you, brother, you are my dream. And, I, and, mm. I, and the reason why I say that is because uh, you did what I'm going to go ahead and say you did what no person of color could have done. And mm. it takes a person of color mm. to say thank mm. you for wow. doing it. That's my privilege. Mm. My privilege is okay. I can tell you what no other white person can tell you. Thank you. Mm. And you did something that no black person would have ever done. You were you were my dream, brother. So thank you Hallelujah. for doing that. Thank yeah. you for being that. And that's how this moves forward. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Colin, Glory I can't God. wait to hug you. Two big brothers hugging each other. It's going to be great. <laughs> Glory to God. My <laughs> eyes are watering now. It's a shame my camera's frozen. <laughs> oh, oh hallelujah, hallelujah. Colin, wow. thank you. Wow. I'm, 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 I'm blown by this, man. Thank you so much, Sarah, for having these sessions. And to everyone who's here tonight, I mean, um, Leon, I'm a big fan. I must tell you that, bro. I've been checking you for a while now. Um, I'm hoping to meet you in the near future <laughs> when everything <laughs> is good and COVID has yeah. passed. Dr. Yeah. Chooks, uh, thank you so much, bro. And I hope when we're coming to the UK, one will get to see you and spend some time. Mr. Les, um, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm blown. I'll tell you this. When I got born again in 1997 on the 26th of January, one of the songs that kept me going in the church that I've served for 24 years now is Alpha and Omega. We are, you are Alpha and Omega. Mm, we mm, mm, mm. When I got to the church in 1997, 98, they were singing that song. And that's one of the songs that pushed us for years. And to have seen um, Israel Houghton do it, and now it has also become a bit of a footprint in the world and all that. Um, it's just amazing. The work that you're doing. Um, I'll tell you this, in 2004, we went to your, I think, head offices in Mobile, Alabama, somewhere there, and we spent time with your boss, and I was still a younger boy, <laughs> but uh, now, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing stuff with my wife, and we're hoping, you know, we, we, we get to meet in the future again so that you guys can hear what we do. We worship us at heart and all that, but here's a verse that I want us to, you know, I, I want to leave with you guys. Uh, Revelation mm. 7, verse 9, it says, after, things, uh, or after these things, I looked, and this is what I saw, a vast multitude, which no one could count, gathered from mm. every nation, mm. and from all the tribes of the people and languages mm. on the earth, standing mm. before the throne, mm. before the mm. Christ, dressed mm. in white robes. I'm going to be in that number. You're going to be in that Amen. number. Amen. If you've taken okay. Christ, you've got to be in that number. Oh, yes. And we Amen. celebrate for that. But it takes us to do things intentionally. And I'm, I, I think music plays a big role as well in doing mm. this. Uh, Leon, let's make sure we get more collaborations between the races and all that. Let's go to China. Let's go to mm. Japan. Let's go to wherever. Let's try and make um, um, Christians to get together so that we can be able to show that this Christ that we're serving is really mm. alive. Amen. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much once again. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry. Last one. Helen. I've checked some of your pictures. I'm also, I also have a, a bit of a good hand, but you're amazing. <laughs> I've checked some of your pictures. Hey, I'm sold. Yeah. <laughs> so if I ever come to South Africa, I'll make sure I get something for you from Helen. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, oh, thank you. That'd be great. <laughs> Yeah. No, thank you so much, guys. I am really, really um, grateful that you took the time. I know Sunday evenings are usually meant for resting um, or just not doing anything at all. I've just seen a few comments. I just want to put a comment regarding the painting, just so that um, Helen can appreciate that as well. Um, this is from Philip. He says, this is so prophetic. Thank God for allowing yourself to be used by God. Um, and I mean, there's been so many comments, just so encouraging. So again, thank you so much, guys. Apologies if you're watching and my camera is frozen. This is not just a picture. I don't know why it's just a picture you're seeing, but hopefully next week I don't have this issue. Thank you so much, Chooks. Thank you, Les. Thank you, Leon. Um, thank you, Colin. Thanks so much, Helen, as well, for availing us of your time. Thank you so much, everyone who's watched live. If you can, please share. the, the, the um, It's going to be automatically saved onto Facebook and YouTube, so please share. And equally, join us again next week. We'll be having another yeah. panel of exciting guests. And the painting, Helen, just so I'm clear, the painting will carry on evolving 
all through the four weeks. So it's the same painting and it's just going to have more and more layers as we go. So you don't want to miss the reveal every week. We we'll continue seeing more um, layers being revealed of the painting. Um, but no, guys, thank you so much. I believe strongly that we will grow together in unity. We'll grow stronger together as we continue in intentionality, in being clear on our identity, which is in Christ and nothing else, in the blood, as Helen has rightly put in the borders of that painting. We are one, we're united, and we're called to be one in the blood. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, guys. And we're going to leave it there. And hopefully we'll catch you again um, next week. Um, yes, thank you so much. God bless you and have a great week. Thank you. Bye. Bye.